Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, everyone. I am your host, Zach Beach, and I'm here with the incredible coach, educator, lecturer, and author, Dr. Allison Ash. Hello, Allison, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Our topic for today is sleaze-free seduction skills. A bit of a tongue twister there. Sleaze-free seduction skills. But before we get into that, let's learn a little bit more about Allison. For those that don't know, Dr. Allison Ash is a sex and intimacy coach and educator, lecturer at Stanford University, author, and founder of TurnOn.Love. A champion for others overcoming shame and deepening pleasure, Allie helps her clients experience the kinds of sexual interactions and romantic relationships that they long for. As a sociologist with a PhD from Stanford, Allie has a comprehensive understanding of the complex societal challenges that often lead to unsatisfying and disempowering sexual experiences. She also draws on her extensive training in the Hakomi method of psychotherapy, as well as the Medica model of sex and intimacy coaching to support her clients to radically explore and courageously express themselves. Allie designs workshops and retreats and offers individuals and couples coaching to give others the tools to discover their desires and confidently pursue them. She invites you to turn on pleasure, intimacy, and love at turnon.love. And I have to say, I've attended a number of her workshops, and they're always amazing. So welcome to the show, Allie. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing so great. Thank you for that very generous intro. So Allie, as a sex and intimacy coach and educator, what are some of the most common issues that people come to you with? There's a wide range of issues. Um, it can relate to being able to be out of their head and into their body and increase their capacity for pleasure. That might mean issues around uh, anorgasmia, difficulty orgasming or erectile dysfunction, having a hard time giving it up, keeping it up, coming when you want to come, not coming when you don't want to come. Uh, it could be things around flirting, seducing, how to recognize when somebody's flirting with you, um, dealing with a lot of things around shame and um, uh, fears of rejection, helping people learn um, how to identify what they want and feel comfortable pursuing it. Oftentimes, I'm working with couples, helping them add the spark back into the relationship. I work with a lot of people around navigating non-monogamy, and, and I also work with people around healing affairs and other kinds of repair work for when ruptures happen in relationships. But the list just goes on. Anything that helps my clients learn how to cultivate and sustain emotional, physical, and sexual intimacy in their lives. I hope those listening also realize that if you're going through any of those issues, you're not alone. This is all part of the fundamental human experience. Yes. Thank you for saying that. So true. There's so much I want to ask you about, particularly because you have a very unique place in the world of working in both academia and coming from academia. But right now, a lot of your focus is on, is on the front lines of coaching individuals and couples together. So let's just first talk about your research and your PhD program that you did. What are some things that you discovered and what are some topics that you went into that you think might really help people to know about? Sure, yeah. Um, I did research originally uh, exploring the college hookup culture and looking at orgasm differentials. So why were college women orgasming so much less often than college men in the qualitative and quantitative studies that we were running? Um, I want to pause you right there because yeah. I want to know the answer to that question. It's <laughs> a good topic, huh? <laughs> Well, we looked, at, we looked at it from a from a sociological lens, so not looking at biological or physiological factors. Uh -huh. um, and what we found is that, and of course, this is specific to college age adults, um, although I do think that some of this lingers into young adulthood as well, um, is this idea that 
both men and women are entitled to pleasure in relationships, but that in hookups, both men and women, and this is, these are hetero hookups, both men and women orientated more around men's pleasure. Mm -hmm. And that women weren't really engaging in the kinds of behaviors that were more likely to result in their orgasm. They were less comfortable asking for them. Um, they often felt uh, more discomfort and shame with uh, in, in hookups. And the men that we were interviewing often reported that they really cared about their girlfriend's pleasure and viewed that as um, an indication of their competency, but that they didn't really prioritize a woman's pleasure and hook up and that it was really much more about them uh, getting off. And so uh, this is one of the reasons why I created my very first workshop, which is called How to Be a Feminist in the Bedroom, uh, to really give everybody the tools that they need to be able to say no to things they want to say no to, say yes to things they want to say yes to, know what they want, feel comfortable advocating for it, and then also learning how to empower their lovers and partners to do the same. So why why is that, however? Why in college-level hookups, hetero hookups, the focus is on male pleasure? Is that the patriarchy operating in the bedroom? It definitely is. And I think it's also this really interesting uh, role or, or reversal that we see nowadays from our parents' generation and maybe even our generation, which is this idea that people hook up before they date. Um, you, you hook up and then maybe you date and then maybe you start a relationship. And so these hookups are happening without a lot of deep levels of trust and familiarity and affect, affection and, and emotional intimacy. And, um, and a lot of times women are engaging in these hookups as a way to try and uh, obtain a relationship mm, and so mm -hmm. their perspective is more about creating a positive experience for the other person because they're wanting to get that emotional connection that feeling of and and this doesn't directly come out of the research this is also coming out of just more of my coaching practice and my work teaching and educating um is it particularly i i just went back to stanford to teach a course this past quarter and talking with a lot of the undergrads about their experiences with the hookup culture and the frustrations around it um and, and a lot of it is about this fact that it feels almost like they're compelled to do it in order to have any intimacy at all mm -hmm. which is really interesting if we want to pop out for a second and explore how the current shelter in place covid recommendations and requirements are actually creating a new reversal where we have to go back to creating emotional intimacy and virtual connections and talking before we can ever physically touch and that's it's, it's really interesting to see how that's playing out yeah, there's so much I want to talk about. Um, so let's just give one more topic. What's some uh, something else that you, like, you've researched that you might want people to know about? Well, my dissertation looked at trans discrimination in the workplace, and um, I think that that's a really valuable topic. So the book that's out, you can get on Amazon, is called Gender Ambiguity, Exploring Trans and Gender Queer Discrimination in the Workplace. And then I would say one other piece that I worked on that's probably directly relevant to my clients is an article exploring pathways to bi identities and bi experiences for women in college. And this is really interesting, especially with the topic about sleuth free seduction skills that we're going to discuss in a bit, because what we found was that women did not really know how to initiate experiences with other women because there aren't necessarily the same social scripts because in our society, men have been socialized to be the initiators and the pursuers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we found that actually a lot of these women were involving men in three-way kisses or threesomes as a way to then have experiences with other women, at least the, the icebreaker or the, the first entryway into an experience is often with a man there as a kind of buffer and support in it. So what I'm hearing from you is that bisexual women feel a certain boundary to exploring that sexuality with other other women and they actually use men sort of to initiate that interaction yeah i think that there's just a lack of clarity around how to do it is she going to be interested am i um how do i get this thing started right then i think that just whether it's with other women or just more broadly um i find that a lot of the women that i coach aren't quite sure how to be in the initiator pursuer role and how to have that kind of agency in their sexual interactions because they don't have as much practice and experience with it 
And so certainly I think that when you have two women that are wanting to interact with each other, then it can kind of feel like, well, how do we get this thing started? Mm -hmm. And uh, the woman that we interviewed, it wasn't always intentional. It wasn't always like, I want to hook up with a woman, so I'm going to involve this man so I can do it. It was just the organic way that it unfolded that gave them access to an experience that they were longing. Since we're getting into it, let's just dive in. Let's talk about Celie's free seduction skills. Because you did talk about this narrative that we have in our culture, that men are the ones doing the seducing and women are the ones being seduced. And here we see one dynamic where that happens, where we put two women together and both are used, used to being in that role of being seduced rather than being the seducer. So my first question is, like, is the stereotype true? Like, in interactions, are men being the ones and role of the seducer? And do women need to step up more? Or what would you say is the solution? Well, I, I try and stay away from shoulds as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't say that I think women should step up more. But what I do want is to make sure that everybody feels empowered to be a co-creator in their experiences and to be able to initiate and feel a sense of agency. Meaning that if I have a crush on somebody and um, I want to be able to express that crush, I want to be able to have the tools to do so. And I think that the work that I do um, with my clients is often very similar regardless of their gender, but there are gendered components to it. And so um, when I'm working with men, it it's oftentimes dealing with things like, uh, I don't think my desire is acceptable or appropriate or will be reciprocated. So I'm not, I, I really contain it. Or I'm so hungry and I, there's so much longing that I kind of flood somebody with my desire. And so I'm teaching them how to be with their desire in a way that creates safety and spaciousness and room for the other person to feel their own desire and also recognize that you have attraction for them. Um, and then with the women that I'm working with, oftentimes it's helping them identify what they want. Um, it's helping them feel comfortable and confident asking for it um, and guiding the experience um, and then giving them the tools to know how to initiate or to reveal desire or to be able to mold the experiences, whether that's regard to pacing or um, any anything else that would create mold it to be more pleasurable for them so that they're not just a passive recipient, but they're actually mm -hmm. an act, taking a more active role. I really love that. It reminds me of the book Slut by Laura Tenenbaum. And when we talk about like reclaiming a woman's sexual desire is that we do have this narrative in our culture that women who with empowered sexual desire are seen as bad, they're seen as dirty, they're seen as a slut. And as a result, people won't, don't want to be seen as the slut. So then they uh, seduce less, they might reduce their sexual desire. So what, how do we get around this? How do we get around like the slut shaming in our culture? How do we get around having people claim the desire in an empowering way? Well, I, I love this question, and I don't necessarily think it's an easy answer. Because the thing about shame that's so interesting is that I don't have to believe that my behavior is wrong or immoral to um, still be able to receive the harmful effects of other people judging me and shaming me for my behavior. And, um, and shame is a fear of rejection. At the core of shame is a fear that you won't belong, that you're gonna not be accepted, and that you'll be alone and rejected. And so the antidote, therefore, is acceptance and belonging. Mm. And so what we need is a cultural shift where we prize women for being sexually empowered, where we accept women for being pursuers and for initiating and for wanting sex in whatever shape and form that that comes in. and um, don't just give women a sense of entitlement to be very sexual in relationships, but also give them that same kind of agency to be able to explore and have casual sexual experiences without incurring judgment or a label. And I think that that's still this, you know, this is the new sexual double standard. Women can have sex before marriage and not be labeled a slut. But if you have too much casual sex, that label is just lurking behind the corner. And so it, it, it's, it's a fine line. And I think that we need to create more spaciousness there. Mm. I just want to repeat something that you said, because it is so important. And it is so beautiful. This idea that shame is a fear of rejection. 
and the antidote is acceptance and belonging. And we see that in both aspects of both the seducer and the seducee. And again, I don't want to gender it too much, but when we talk about, say, you know, a man approaching a woman, there is that fear of rejection. If you do approach somebody and you ask them out, they could say no, and that could bring up your own shame. So I know a lot of men who have sort of stopped asking, or at least there is a lot of fear about asking a woman out. So before we get into how to do that in kind of a not creepy way, how might we get over the fear of rejection? And this can be men or women. How might we get over the fear of rejection in approaching somebody? It's really hard. And I think that men are more rejection sensitive because they have faced and dealt with a lot more of it, given the ways that our society has structured intimacy, putting men in the role of being the initiator and pursuer. And I, I think that rejection is hard for everybody. And what's really important is to remember that chemistry is an interactional, co-created experience. Meaning that if there is not chemistry between you and Isaac, it's not fair to conclude that something is wrong with you or something is wrong with me. Rather, there's just something in the way that you and I interact that doesn't produce this experience of chemistry. And when we can take it out of the I'm not enough or I'm too much narrative and rather put it in a framework of I'm not going to have chemistry with everybody, nor do I want to have chemistry with everybody. Um, and what I want to do is learn how can I create the conditions for chemistry to organically develop, but also not blame myself when it doesn't. Mm. So your advice is like, if you feel that rejection, not to put it on yourself. Like there's, you meet people all the time and there's no chemistry and that's okay. Right, right. And um, and the human brain is actually only capable of maintaining so many human connections at any time. And what has been one of the biggest changes for me, because I have all of this core wounding around not belonging and, um, and that, you know, that's just where I go to my sensitive place. And one of the things that has been really helpful for me is just um, actually finding a little bit of gratitude when there isn't connection because it frees me up to invest my time and energy in the relationships where there is connection. And so if you're feeling sensitive because you've had an experience that registers as rejection for you, what I recommend that you do is you turn to your friends, your family, your housemates, your other lovers and partners, whoever is in your relational field that loves you and accepts you and is willing to offer you that kind of validation and reassurance. And to not think that it's pathetic to ask for it, but that's the antidote, right? And you don't have to get acceptance from the person who's who you're feeling rejected from to still get that experience of of feeling like you belong, that you matter, and that people in this world care about you. So finding that source of acceptance and belonging from a loving network of people in your life you think might help somebody get over the shame they feel around rejection in an intimate realm. Definitely. Okay, I love all of the things that you're saying. So first, we source a feeling of acceptance and belonging within ourselves, and we realize that Chemistry is an interactional co-created experience, which I love. Chemistry is an interactional co-created experience. And I muster up the, the courage to approach somebody that I'm interested in. How do I do that in a way that's not creepy? What does it even mean to be creepy, first of all? Yes. Uh, well, there's a couple of different things that can kind of fall under the creepy category. But I think it's important to just say off the bat that creepy is a subjective experience, meaning that what you register as creepy might not register for me as creepy and vice versa. Um, and that creepiness is often a projection, meaning that I might feel awkward or uncomfortable and because I feel awkward or uncomfortable in our interaction, I'm going to project that you're creepy. And so I just want to say this to kind of de-shamify the experience of being creepy. Because I can tell you that every person on this earth has been registered as creepy at some point in their life and will continue <laughs> to register as creepy to somebody in their future in their life because there's nothing that you can do to make sure that, um, that you're completely 
uh, safe to every person every time because it's so subjective. But I am going to talk about some things that um, tend to create creepy experiences for a wide range of people. Um, and I'm also going to talk about what we can do to create safety in a way that is going to set us up for the most success that we can. And then I think it's also important to learn how to repair failed attempts. So if you flirt or if you initiate and it's not well received and they're offended or or whatever happens, they, they receive you as creepy, that you know how to repair those experiences um, so that A, you're less afraid of being received as creepy and B, the other person can feel a little bit of, of reconnection or, or um, at least a feeling of being seen and understood, which then can create more safety and reduce the feeling of being yeah i'm almost reminded of like let's just say like a man approaches a woman at a gas station and he says excuse me miss and she says i have a boyfriend <laughs> and he goes that's great but your tire is flat you might want to get that checked out <laughs> and I mean, there's a number of things happening in this interaction one as, as kind of the female in this example i feel like you know you're used to being approached a lot and you have to reject a lot of people and you kind of build up this wall but on the same level, like the man approaching the woman, because he's not taking it, it personally in that situation, he doesn't necessarily feel that shame. So I'm wondering what you can might recommend about like the perceived wall that you experience from people uh, when approaching them. Well, I think the scenario that you laid out is one of the toughest scenarios. It's like the cold call flirt, right? You have no previous connection. You're out in public where you're doing other things that are not related to connection and um, intimacy and you're just kind of throwing it out there. It's like doing it in a coffee shop or when you're passing somebody on the street. Um, those situations tend to be the toughest because you're not really given a lot of opportunity to create safety. And I think that seduction is the balance of creating safety and turn on. Mm. Because if you have too much turn on and not enough safety, the walls come up. And if you have too much safety and not enough turn on, you get friend zoned. So you have to figure out how to find the inter. Can you say that again? That sure. was so wonderful. If you have too much turn on and not enough safety, then the walls come up. Because even though you might feel that desire, it doesn't feel safe to go there. Mm. And if there's too much safety and not enough turn on, then you get friend zoned. Mm. Because you're definitely a wonderful person, but they're not feeling any eros or chemistry or sexual charge. Wonderful. Continue. Okay. To back up a step before we talk about how to create safety and turn on and to go back to this topic of creepiness for a second, I think that some of the things that fall under you know, the pretty consistent bucket of what people register as creepy includes a lack of honesty and transparency. And really this can... Uh, be two main categories. It can be not revealing your emotions and not being emotionally vulnerable, or it could be not willing to reveal your desires. And the interesting thing about this is a lot of people don't reveal their desire because they don't want somebody else to feel uncomfortable as a result of them having desire. Mm -hmm. But the very act of hiding your desire can create the experience you're trying to avoid, which is the other person feeling uncomfortable because they can sense something is in the field, but it's not being named. And that can feel awkward. And especially if like, if I can tell that you have a crush on me, or I think you might have a crush on me, Zach, but you're not revealing it and you're not talking about it and you're kind of hiding it, then I can't really talk about it with you. And it, it's not something that we can address. And it's something that we kind of have to skirt around. It becomes the elephant in the room. Otherwise, I have to do the very risky thing of saying, do you have a crush on me? Which is like, you know, very few people are going to do something like that. And so it's, you know, I love the sacrifice that people are making to try and have other people feel comfortable, but it's, it's having the opposite effect often. And so, and so I really want to encourage people to figure out how they can be honest and transparent in ways that are still attuned, right? There is definitely, you know, you can dump on somebody. Um, and so we'll talk about, we can talk about that more as well, but making sure that we're revealing ourselves is a powerful way to create safety. Uh, vulnerability begets vulnerability and uh, vulnerability creates safety. So seduction is the balance of safety and turn on. And we create safety by being honest and transparent. 
And I'm wondering kind of specifically what that looks like. Like you're not going to approach somebody in a bar and say, hi, I have crippling anxiety and of mother issues. How do you do? What kind of level of honesty are we talking about here? Totally. As you ask that question, I'm reminded of like uh, conversations with parents where, we, where we're talking about how to deliver information at age appropriate levels. So how do you talk to sex with a four-year-old versus an eight-year-old versus a 14-year-old, right? And I think that this is very similar. How you reveal vulnerability when you don't know somebody is going to be very different than how you reveal vulnerability when you're um, deeply connected. And so, you know, I, I can give you an example of a way that can work well when you're not really connected with somebody uh, where you don't have a lot of familiarity. I was flirting with this woman and we were at a cuddle party and so we were cuddling and it was a little bit unclear um, if she had any desire for me because, you know, this goes back to our original conversation, you know, how do you initiate and pursue and everybody's cuddling. So the cuddling in and of itself didn't indicate desire and I could feel myself getting a little bit nervous and you know I, I've had experiences I'm sure many queer women have had of um, revealing desire to other women and then them not being interested and feeling uncomfortable and then it creating distance and awkwardness I'm sure men can relate to this too of course mm -hmm. it's a pretty universal experience and so I was feeling all of this nervousness and hesitation and so what I said to her is um I want to confess that I find you really attractive and I can sense that I'm doing this thing that I do when I have a crush on women, which is that I get really nervous and I don't reveal it and I don't want to do that with you. Mm, wow. And how was that received? Oh, I mean, we dated. It was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it was very well <laughs> received. Worked. But here's the thing is that even if she wasn't available, let's say she wasn't queer or she had a relationship and was monogamous or whatever else it was, I, there's something so flattering about that. There's something really vulnerable and sweet about that, that I have to imagine she would have received it really well and responded really tenderly and kindly, even if she wasn't available for whatever reason. And, you know, there's, I'm not giving her my whole life story. I'm not talking to her about all my failed attempts. I'm not talking to her about my crippling anxiety. But what I am doing is I'm just revealing one of the cards of my deck that is is the elephant in the room that's preventing me from doing the thing that I want to be doing, which is saying, hey, do you want to go on a date with me sometime? Mm -hmm. I like that you bring up sort of the environment that you're in as playing a role. Like, obviously, if you're with your coworker and you say, I've been really attracted to you, this is a, somebody that you see every single day and very easily sour the relationship. In this case, you're at like a cuddle party and you're already like exploring this level of connection the eros is high and it's kind of fun this like back and forth this like i'm kind of feeling this way what about you i'm kind of feeling this way what about you so that talks a little bit about safety and then you're already in an environment which sort of stimulates a level of turn on the, this opposite side of our seduction so let's move from safety to turn on how do we sort of elevate that level of turn on with somebody Without being creepy, of course. Right. Well, I think what's really important is to, and, and this is maybe a bridge that we can talk about of, of connecting safety with turn on, is this idea of attuned pacing. So a pacing that is uh, well calibrated for the other person. And if, and there's this concept that I borrow from the tech community called last known good state. And uh, for the engineers listening out there, please forgive me if I slightly corrupt this, but um, my understanding of this concept is that if you're working on an app or something and the version of the app that you're working on fails, you don't just throw the whole app out, you go back to the last version of the app that was working and you rebuild from there. And so when we're talking about creating turn on in a way that is safe and attuned, what I really want to encourage people to do is to remember the last known good state. And this is something that's really important because it takes this idea of flirting and creating turn on and it makes it applicable to any situation, whether it's something where you have an ongoing relationship because, hello, you still need to seduce and turn on even in long-term relationships, or if it's something that feels really new and uncertain that you can still apply this concept. So. Um, when you're creating turn on, you are escalating. And there are a lot of different patterns of how this escalation might look. And some of the things I do 
with my clients and in my sleaze free seduction skills workshop is I actually flesh out what some of these escalation patterns can look like. And what I, what I want to guide people to do is to realize that as they're moving from one rung of the escalation ladder to the next rung, that what they're doing is they're wanting to track to see how is that being received by the other person? Reading body language, noticing other cues, perhaps even checking in verbally. And um, if it's not well received, if it's too much too soon, that you don't just jump off the ladder altogether and turn away and disconnect, but that instead what you do is you go to the last rung of the ladder and hang out there. Maybe you need to go two rungs lower to reestablish safety and attunement. And then, and then you, and then you continue to stay in connection. Uh, because here's the thing is that most of us, when we receive a no, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, we feel rejected and we disconnect. So if you and I are making out and then you put your hand up my shirt and I push your hand away, you might feel rejected by me and then disconnect where I'm still down to keep making out with you. And you're feeling rejected because I pushed your hand away and you disconnecting from me then has me feel disconnected and maybe like it's not okay to say no to you or there's a cost to saying no to you. And then that disrupts safety. Whereas instead, if you can... Um, keep making out with me and, and keep hanging out with me, or maybe we're not making out, but we stay cuddling and we stay in connection. And then maybe we reestablish that and we make out again in a little bit, but you're willing to play with me where I'm at. That allows my own turn on to develop at my organic pace and allows, um, allows me to know, notice that you are noticing me and willing to re adjust and stay with me. And that's going to have me feel like my nose are fully welcomed by you, which makes it so much easier to say yes and also easier to explore my maybes because if my maybe ever becomes a no, I trust that you're going to be okay with that. You know, I didn't want to bring this up, um, but now it's reminding me of this idea that comes actually from the pickup artist community which is what they call IOIs or indicators of interest, which is based on this idea that before you sort of progress into intimacy with somebody, rather from talking to holding hands or sitting in a booth together or away from other people, is you look for three IOIs or indicators of interest. And one of them could be like they laugh at your jokes or they ask you a question about yourself, like what do you do? And so I'm hearing from you is that, you know, you want to be attuned to this person that you're with, this person that you're escalating with. And I'm also wondering, well, what kind of signals, what kind of things are you looking for that act as sort of like a go ahead, a green light? Yeah, a lot of it is in body language and in reciprocal uh, reci reciprocity. If you're in the situation where you're wanting to flirt with somebody at a coffee shop and you're not in connection with them at all yet, the very first thing that I recommend that you do is you you look at them and you see if you can catch their eye contact. Now, not staring at them, and I definitely <laughs> demonstrate the difference, right? But you see if you can catch their eye. And here's the interesting thing about eye contact is most people have a, a habitual instinct to look away when they make first make eye contact. So if I want to flirt with you at the bar, Zach, and I catch your eye and you look at me and then you look away really quickly, what I want to do is I want to be available for the look back. So I don't want to keep staring at you so that then you feel like, why is this creepy person not like only staring at me? But what I want to do is keep you kind of in my periphery and track for you looking back at me the second time, which often happens, and then catch you and smile, right? And so this is this way of creating opportunities for reciprocity. Um, and then, uh, you know, I talk about different um, ways that you can flirt and I think the important thing is to give ways out. And this is true whether you're doing verbal flirting and nonverbal flirting, that in order for it to be really consensual, you need to make it easy for somebody to say no to you. And the easier it is for somebody to say no to you, the more you can infer the not saying no <laughs> as an indication that they have some interest. Now, not saying no is not the same thing as a yes. I want to make sure to be clear about that. You know, an example of doing that verbally is something called a three-part invitation, where I share my desire, I inv invite your desire, and then I give you a very easy way out. So I might say something like, 
Zach, it was so fun talking with you today. I really enjoy this connection. And um, if you're open to it, I would love to hang out and see if we have any chemistry. And if you're not available for that, I want you to know that I've just really enjoyed connecting with you today. And so three part invitation. I love that. I heard from you. It was so fun talking to you today. I enjoyed this connection. Would you like to? Is that the three parts? That's part one and part two. Part one is I, I, I want more. Mm -hmm. Part two is do you want more? Mm -hmm. And then part three is if not, I want you to know that I had a great time and I feel really grateful for what we've shared. Mm. This is one example of a way out. But you could also say, I could also say, um, you know, if not, like I would be available to meet virtually again and, and, and continue the conversation. Another example of a three-part invite might be, um, you know, the, to go back to the making out example uh, where you're putting your hand up my shirt and I'm saying no to that, right? You might say instead of trying it non-verbally by, by trying putting your hand up your shirt, my shirt, you might say, um, I'm loving making out with you. If you're open to escalating, I'd love to get naked with you. And if not, I'm so happy to keep making out. I know that we both live in like the Bay Area where there's kind of like a saying that you could throw a dildo out a window and hit a sex party. And, you know, I feel like a lot of the situations are describing of like, oh, we're making out. So am I allowed to put my hand under your shirt? You're already in like a very intimate environment maybe a cuddle party maybe a sex party maybe a second base party or just one sort of gathering where people have a lot less inhibitions and i'm wondering like shifting to like i don't know something like middle america or just anybody who might be like literally swiping right and swipe swiping left right now in tinder and bumble right now and i've really just had a hard time building connection with anybody how would we kind of put this person on like the right path towards meeting people, towards seducing them in a safe and attuned way and elevating that level of connection, you know, with somebody who maybe doesn't even want to make out until like the third or fourth or fifth date? Well, I think that the, it's important to realize that there's sexual intimacy, emotional intimacy and physical intimacy. And that these different kinds of intimacies can feed and reinforce one another, but they are actually distinct. Mm. So if I'm not ready for sexual intimacy, then what you can focus on is creating more emotional intimacy. We can talk about topics that feel really personal and slowly increase our vulnerability as we're self-revealing. And we can also focus on physical intimacy. So uh, I might not be available for like making out, but maybe we can cuddle or hold hands or you can put your arm around my shoulder. Um, some of these non-sexual ways of touching that can create safety and connection. And so I would say uh, if, if somebody for whatever reason isn't available for um, whatever it is that you're interested in, I would challenge you to get creative and to explore your Venn diagram of shared yeses. So what's a yes for you? What's a yes for me? Wherever that overlaps, that's where we'll play. So tell me about this Venn diagram of shared yeses. So am I in one circle on the diagram and I have things that I am open to doing like in the moment and then the person that I'm with has a Venn diagram of yeses that they're open to in the moment and then we want to figure out where we overlap? Yes, that's the goal. Now, unfortunately, we're operating with a lot of imperfect information and a lot of people aren't really aware of what they're open to, what their yeses are, noes and maybes might be. And so I think that what we want to do is do our best to know what we're interested in and then uh, explore escalating in a way that feels well attuned and titrated. Meaning if we're on a first date and I really want to make out with you, what I need to do is think about, okay, I don't know if Zach wants to make out with me. And there's a lot of steps that I could do between this kind of conversation of non-touch that we're at right now to then try and make out with you. And, and can I do some of these things along the way to see how much buy-in I can get from you? So what I might do at first is I might do like a fleeting touch on the arm. And just notice, do you reciprocate it? Do you move away? Do you flinch? Do you smile and warm up like how does that land then i might like track for our, um what happens if i linger that touch on your arm a little bit longer and i want to see that it's being 
well received and reciprocated before I ever even consider attempting to make out with you. Like there are these steps that need to happen along the way. I'd probably want to see if you're open for sharing a hug first. Um, and then I have this wonderful technique that I teach called the almost kiss which is a way of um, getting nonverbal consent to kiss somebody. And it includes first looking at their lips and looking at your own lips and um, kind of leaning in a little bit and seeing do they lean back in and making sure that they have plenty of space to lean back, that there's not like a wall or a person behind them because a couple degrees of movement can be really significant. And, um, and tracking along the way for are you a yes? And realizing that this is all creating more anticipation, more buildup, more turn on, and it's allowing me to see both, I could do it non-verbally with the almost kiss and also using certain verbal techniques to see, um, are you available for the things that I'm also available for? I love that concept, the, the almost kiss, to see if the kiss is going to happen. And I wouldn't mind shifting a little bit more forward into a relationship. So far, we've talked about escalating intimacy, and I also really enjoy your distinction between sexual, physical, and emotional intimacy that you can build with somebody. Now, let's fast forward in the relationship to 5, 10, 15 years, because I'm sure there's a number of listeners who either they're married or they're, they're in a long-term relationship who don't, who don't think that these seduction uh, skills apply to them. But you already mentioned before that we can seduce somebody at every stage and every step in our relationships. So what does sleaze free seduction skills look like to a 5, 10, 15 year relationship? Yeah, I love that question so much because I think that it's really vital to consider this to make sure that the spark stays alive or even to add the spark back into relationships um, is how can we seduce our partner? And realizing that oftentimes in long-term relationships, we need to have more planning and more extensive escalation ladders, meaning that it often requires more warm-up, uh, more foreplay, anticipation, teasing, um, because you don't have that new relationship energy in the flood of uh, hormones like and chemicals like the oxytocin and norepinephrine and serotonin and dopamine that you get when you're falling in love with somebody that makes it so that you don't need all of that foreplay and warm up to get into the mood. And so thinking about you know, ways that you can seduce might include drawing your partner a bath or offering a massage or playing the this or that game, which is something I love to recommend to my clients do that offers a way of um, giving touch that helps you get into your body and evaluate touch and opens up lines of communication that can be really fun and flirty. Or um, maybe you play a game of truth or dare, or you cook a really romantic dinner with sensual food and you feed each other, but that you're thinking about fun ways of creating the opportunity for that turn on to develop. And also to remember that you can start this experience of seducing and creating turn on hours before you're ever available for having sex. So let's say you and I live together, we're in a long-term relationship, and um, you want to seduce me in the morning for a potential sexy time experience later that night when we get home. So in the kitchen, as we're making breakfast, you come over and you whisper something sexy in my ear about how hot I look and you kiss me on my neck. And then maybe you send me a text during the day with like, you know, a sexy photo or um, a description of what you're fantasizing about doing to me. And then maybe when I come home, there is something laid out on the bed for me to put on an essential playlist playing. Um, and But we're still having dinner, right? So again, like, you know, I, I have a whole day to start to imagine and fantasize and create my own turn on and allow for this experience to have a slow burn. Ooh, first of all, I'm getting turned on just listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> I know you're very good at what you do. And I don't know how it happened, but we are running out of time. And, you know, it's amazing listening to you. You're so smart and so intelligent. And I love all the concepts that you bring in. And I wanted to just kind of close it out with two questions. The first question is, what is this this or that game? Sure. The way that the, this or that game works is you offer one kind of touch and you vary that kind of touch 
um, on one variable. So now you're really getting a sense of my geeky scientist side. So um, there's a lot of different ways you can touch somebody. So you can do like a walking touch or a stroking touch or a scratch or a pinch or a spank or, a, you know, there's a kneading or a massage, right? And then if you're using your mouth, you can blow, nibble, suck, lick, kiss, bite, right? So if I take one kind of touch, like let's say I'm going to stroke your back with my hand. What I want to do is I want to vary it on one of three variables. And the three variables are pace, intensity, and location. So the first, I might vary it on pace. And I might offer you a slow stroke versus a fast stroke. And I'm, I'll say, do you like this or do you like that? And you could say A, B, both or neither. And if you say you like the slow stroke, then I might offer you the slow one and one that's even slower. So I can calibrate how slow you like it. Once I understand the pace that you like, I might then play with intensity. So I might do it at the pace you like and do it more firmly and then do it at the pace you like and do it more softly and ask what you like and calibrate intensity. And then we can calibrate location and that's both where in your body, uh, me stroking your back will feel very different than me stroking your arm. But it can also be how much area I'm covering. Me stroking your back from your lower back all the way up to your neck will feel very different than me just stroking your lower back. And then you can think about starting to maybe evaluate different kinds of touch, but really exploring each touch um, with this level of intention and thoroughness is really powerful because if the receiver has a hard time getting out of their head, if they have a hard time switching from their roles of being an employee or a, a parent or whatever else it is, or they're just stressed. When I'm offering two kinds of touch, the receiver has to go into their body to evaluate them. And that is giving them practice of returning to a more sensual space. Mm. And it also starts to open up lines of communication because the receiver is going to tell me which one they like better. And then pretty soon the receiver might start saying, can you try this? Or I'm curious what this would feel like. And now we've started to create a really beautiful dialogue uh, and a openness to exploring that can create intimacy regardless and oftentimes can be a wonderful precursor to something that um, is more sexually intense. So I hope all our listeners got that. Uh, and I hope they go home, play this or that. Remember, pace, intensity, and location. And if you it back to us on the show, comment. You can make a comment on the show. Let us know how it went. Yes, I would be so, I would be so happy to hear. <laughs> uh, I'll get into my last question because I wanted to learn more about your class at Stanford and um, what you teach there. But I'll frame this question in a totally different way. Rather than teaching just one class at Stanford, I want you to imagine you're giving a lecture to the entire world. And what do you want everyone to know about love or sex? Wow. <laughs> what a question. Mm -hmm. And I actually, to be honest and vulnerable, I feel tears coming to my eyes because I so wish for that opportunity and to just tell the world that love is why we are here. We are here to love and to be loved and it's not finite and it's not something that we have to reserve and that, and that love is truly why we get up in the morning and that you know babies who are fed but not touched won't survive we need touch we need human connection we are interdependent beings and i think that so often we build all of these defenses and barriers around loving and being loved because it's so scary and so terrifying and what i just wish that the world could experience is that all of the loss and the, all the rejection is worth it. And that mm. on the other side of disconnection is connection. And that love is abundant. It is so abundant. And to just keep ourselves open and receptive to it. And to not deny our desire for it because we don't mm. think that we can have it. Love is abundant. Just keep yourself open and receptive. Ah. <sighs> <laughs> tingles up my spine so thank you dr allison ash thank you ali for joining us on the show how do people find you get in touch with you my website is www.turnon.love and uh, on there you can see the wide range of workshops that i'm teaching including a bunch of virtual workshops 
as well as my coaching practice. Um, and you can contact me through my website. And also there's a bunch of resources on there. And so I really want to encourage you to, to check that out. And then you can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at turnon.love. Thank you so much again for being on the show. And thank you listeners for listening to the show. We hope you learned something. We hope you realize that love is abundant. So all you need to do is keep yourself open and receptive. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about the show at zachbeach.com and theheartcenter.com. Thank you so much, Zach. This was truly a joy. Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, head over to ZachBeach.com or TheHeartCenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 